10. That's on his way, but if you want to get started, can you start him off, please? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the work session for December 16, 2022 on transit program development plan. And it's a work session. We will not be taking public comment. And we'll start off with an introduction from uh, Mr. Mason. Yes. Councilman, thank you. Tom Mason, the director of the Metropolitan Planning Organization. Just a Real quick um, introduction and explanation of the MPO's involvement with the transit program. The MPO's budget combines the federal planning funds from the Federal Transit Administration and the Federal Highway Administration planning funds into one pot of money, which is then managed by the MPO policy committee that approves the budget and because of the involvement of the federal transit administration planning funds into the MPO planning budget we um, work hand in hand with the Cheyenne transit program and do the planning uh, for for them they're a small staff so we uh, take over that planning function for the transit program. And we also supply annually um, a lot of uh, support services for the Cheyenne transit program with the combination of those two pots of planning dollars. So we have uh, been doing a transit development plan for the transit program um, about Every five years is when we update the transit development plan. So it's time to do it again. And we started this contract with LSC uh, Transportation Consultants in August of 2021. And during the development of the process, as, as we'll get into with the presentation, we've had a, a very uh, active uh, public involvement where we did had open surveys for the community, uh, did onboard surveys on the transit buses, had a public open house on January 19th of 2022 at the library. And we've done a few presentations um, during the development of the plan with the MPO committees and the um, transit advisory committee. And with that, I'd like to introduce A.T. Stoddard with LSC Transportation Consultants. He'll do the presentation and we're here to answer any other questions you might have on the development of this plan. Okay, thanks, Tom. And uh, Mr. Stoddard, before we go on, who do we got on Zoom, Jen? We have Councilman Seagrave, Councilman White, Dr. Rennie, and Councilman Johnson. Okay. Uh, do any of the councilmen have a question before we go on to Mr. Stoddard? Uh, none for me, Mr. Escobel. Okay, and uh, Councilman Roybal just showed up, so I'll let him take over. Hey, go ahead, Mr. Stoddard. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. Again, A.T. Stoddard with LSC Transportation Consultants. Uh, just to give you a quick overview, and, and this is going to be a, a really a, a summary of what's in the plan and what we've done. But, but we start out with just an update on the planning process, where we are, uh, and then move to the recommended service plan and the, the changes that we are recommending and kind of where we go from here, next steps to wrap this up. In, in terms of the approach and schedule, because we began really in, in earnest uh, last winter and we put together an interim report 
looked at existing conditions. Uh, we looked at the ridership patterns, looked at changes that we thought needed to be made, uh, developed some options, presented those, went through and, and refined those to get to where we have the actual recommendations, which are both operating and, and capital plans. And where we are right now is uh, we have a, the draft transit development plan. Uh, we had that out uh, this fall. And we were, uh, although the schedule shows here uh, fall 2022 for the final, uh, at this point, that's going to wrap into early or into the winter, sometime early 2023, when we finish that up. In in terms of just some of the background information, this graph shows the ridership trend on both your fixed route and your demand response prior to 2020, when you transitioned from fixed route service to the micro transit on demand service. And you can see that the, that the ridership had, had been declining there are a number of factors in there. Uh, partly uh, you had a fare increase, uh, economy was good, gasoline prices were low, all those things are attractive for people to use other options rather than transit. So that, that trend was, was already there. And then with uh, the pandemic hitting in 2020, transition to the micro transit service, transit ridership went down, but that happened everywhere, all across the country. People weren't working or staying at home. Um, and we're still seeing it isn't coming back to where it was. And I think people ask, well, what's happening? And you know, there's a, a, a change in the dynamics of people's employment. And we've got hybrid model, people working from home, people coming in the office some days a week, not others. And so I think that transition is still in place and will be sorted out. But transit systems across the country are seeing the same thing. That ridership has not come back where it was uh, 2019. A couple of other slides just to give you a, an idea of what we, we looked at. This map shows your previous fixed route service. So this was up uh, through 2019 and then into 2020 when you, you made the change. The the dots show the passenger activity by bus stop. So the larger the uh, circle there, or the larger the dot, the more passengers were using that particular stop. And, and just to highlight the downtown area, that's because the, it was a transfer center uh, out at the uh, North Walmart, again, a transfer center, but also a lot of activity just with Walmart and another large one, the uh, East side Walmart. So not, not surprising there. What we did was we then looked at the ridership pattern for your current micro transit service. So there are no routes being operated that it's on demand. People make the request, but you can see again, similar patterns, uh, activity in downtown, the North Walmart, um, some out to the East Walmart. And so we, we looked at that, but I think more interesting was then we came back, took that micro transit ridership pattern and looked at how it compared with where the routes had previously operated. So the question was, is the ridership pattern changed or are we seeing the same stops being used? And as, as you look at this map, again, you can see uh, a lot of the activity is along areas that were served by the previous fixed route. So out to the East Walmart, the North side, the mall, the, the North Walmart there. And that, that set the question, is it appropriate to bring back fixed route service in some areas? Uh, maybe all, maybe not all of the areas. And that's that led us to a lot of the analysis we did. Uh, some of the other uh, input, I won't uh, go through these. Tom mentioned uh, pretty much all of these. The only other thing I'd say is the website. We did have a website up where interim reports were posted and opportunities were made for people to provide comment um, as we went along, and that, that opportunity is there with the uh, the draft plan as well. So I'm going to move from there to what we have in terms of the recommendations. I'm going to go through several slides here, uh, show you the recommended service plan. That the recommendations are for the changes to be implemented in three phases. So we do a, one phase each year, the first phase beginning in this uh, coming year, and then the next two phases following in the next two years. The first phase does uh, look at bringing back fixed route service on two routes. So we continue the micro transit on demand service. The shaded areas show zones where we are proposing to 
continue micro transit service. So that would still be available, but we had two routes operating between downtown and, and the North Walmart. The first route would start out uh, at the transit center, the transit facility into downtown, then it uses uh, Warren Central up to Del Range, serves them all over to the Walmart. The second route comes out of downtown, uh, out on Pershing to college, back up to Del Range and to the north side Walmart. So we're recommending there is they the routes operate hourly. That's a 30 minute one way trip. Would be possible to make transfers uh, downtown and at Walmart. And the other thing that we bring back that you not been operating separately is the complimentary paratransit service, which serves the needs of people with disabilities who cannot use fixed route service. And that area is what this uh, boundary shows here, that within that area, people who are eligible for that service would be receiving the complimentary paratransit. So sum up, we have the micro transit to cover a broader area. We put those fixed routes where we saw the highest level of demand, passenger activity, bring those back and bring back the complimentary paratransit. Phase two uh, builds on this and basically add two more fixed routes to cover areas that had been covered by fixed route before. So the, the third route we're looking at adding is this one shown in the lighter blue, then out of downtown and goes out, serves the east side out to the east Walmart. The fourth route to be added is shown in red, coming out, out of uh, downtown and Ames Deming, out to college, serving the, uh, the college there and back to uh, the east Walmart. So this would allow uh, transfers potentially at the east side Walmart, uh, at a point, uh, not necessarily a transit center or hub, but certainly at Pershing and, and college where people could transfer if need to, to uh, between the two routes there. Again, the recommendation is those routes operate hourly. We've got transfer points and the micro transit service would still continue. And as with the complimentary paratransit service, I think one of the things to point out again is the micro transit is expanding out beyond the areas where we have the fixed routes. We have a large area covered the paratransit boundary then again shown uh, around those fixed routes. So that's the this second phase. The third phase, the, no change to the routes, but what's proposed here, and this is based a lot on what we heard from the public comment, the surveys and the meetings, is to add evening and Sunday service. And to do that uh, with the level of demand, we did not see that uh, Fixed route service continuing later into the evening or on Sundays was cost effective, but the micro transit service could meet those needs. And so the recommendation is that the fixed route service would op uh, operate during the day and then in the evenings until 10 p.m. we'd have the micro transit pick up that demand and on Sunday it would be micro transit service. Those are the recommendations and then beyond that as demand uh, grows or indicates it certainly would be possible to put more route uh, more buses on any of the individual routes increase the frequency there and that would depend on on demand um, funding availability and availability of vehicles in the future so I, I did want to show this we did have some um, comment as we went through and presented some of the options and that was the the need for fixed route and that we need to serve areas that were served before and so what this map shows is the proposed service overlaid over what you had for the previous fixed route service. And you can see there are, there are areas, so the light blue shading shows the walking, reasonable walking distance around what we're proposing. So out South Greeley, out on uh, West Lincoln Way, up to the north of Del Range, there are some areas where we are not proposing to serve using fixed route service, but on this map, you can also see the dots showing passenger activity. And when you look at that, the areas that we are not getting to with fixed route either have no dots or very small dots indicating we, we really did not have historic ridership there. So those areas will still be served. They'll be covered by the micro transit service, 
but rather than running a, a bus there every hour for 12 hours a day, you send a, a smaller van out when that person needs a ride. And then you take it back out when they need to go. And, and so more cost effective in those area outlying areas. But all of the areas that had um, high demand previously, we are uh, continuing to cover those. Uh, we do have an, uh, financial projections. We've run the cost estimates and shown the uh, projected uh, revenue needs for the service. I'm not going to go into the, into the numbers, but did want to point out, uh, although the really the focus was on five-year uh, transit development plan, we've run these projections out for 10 years, so you have an idea of where things will be headed. Uh, the next area is just capital improvements, and we identified fleet replacement needs, uh, particularly as you look at uh, restructuring the service where you would have larger vehicles on the routes but smaller vehicles for the micro transit on demand service. Uh, we have included, I think in uh, 2008, transitioning to electric vehicles um, as an option. That's probably something to be decided in the future, but at least identify that as a possibility and uh, what that uh, understanding what costs are today and what that would look like along with charging stations and then uh, we have discussion of potential transfer sites uh, in the downtown area as well as other hubs. Uh, the capital plan, again, reflects fleet replacement. Uh, it does have those electric vehicles in in 2008, uh, improvements to the transfer for a downtown transit center, uh, mobility hubs, work on the administrative facility. And, and so again, the capital budget has been projected out for 10 years. The, just comment on, with the public comment opportunities, uh, we did put together an online video presentation, um, similar to what you're seeing today, but just providing that people can look at it, an online uh, questionnaire where people can respond. Uh, we've got it on the planning website so people can see the draft plan uh, and provide their comments. And then just, wrap up with in our next steps. One, obviously the public comment, taking those on the draft plan. And then we have a number of presentations scheduled uh, at this point, January and February. Uh, we're meeting with the MPO committees, the technical committee, uh, citizens committee, policy committee, uh, city, county. I think we're on uh, slated to be back before you with a, a formal presentation on one of your meetings uh, with the draft, uh, with the planning commission and same thing with County and we get through all of that and have the comments. We'll incorporate any any changes that are appropriate and submit the uh, final transit development plan for you. And so, with that, if you have any questions for me, I, I know we've got other comments to follow, but I'm sure I can answer questions um, later as well after you hear from the others. Yeah. Mr. Chair, quick question. About a three phase. You talked about three phases. Is there a timeline between each phase or can we adjust the timeline if we if the ridership's up? You, you certainly can. Um, our recommendation as we phased it, and this was a discussion with, with staff as well, is that right now the phases are in increments of, of one year. So phase one this year, phase two, uh, 2024, phase three the year after. Um, you can adjust that. Uh, again, uh, Demand is uh, one of the things to be addressed. The other, obviously, is, is just resources to be able to do it. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions from anyone on Zoom for Mr. Stoddard? We have um, Councilman White and Councilman Seagrave with their hands raised. Okay, go ahead, Councilman White. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, first off, I really want to uh, Thank you. I know a great deal of work was put into this uh, study. Uh, so I have two questions. What is the reasoning behind uh, phase one, going to phase one first and not doing like phase, having phase two be like phase one? It seems to me that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm real happy that a fixed route is recommended because I've heard from many constituents about the importance of having a fixed route and going back to that. So I'm in complete support of that. But on the phase two plan, um, it seems like that expanded uh, area, particularly covering 
uh, South Cheyenne and the uh, L Triple C would be uh, would be more beneficial as far as demand uh, and service. So I'm just kind of asking why starting why did you start at phase one where it is instead of going to like uh, the phase two area at the beginning? Mr. Stoddard, or thank you, Councilman White, I think I believe it was. Mm -hmm. uh, primarily as we look at the historic ridership pattern, both with your previous fixed route and with the micro transit, the, the areas with the higher, higher ridership were those that are covered by the, the routes in, in phase one. So we, we basically put routes in where we saw the highest level of demand based on actual observed ridership. Uh, although there is ridership on the south side, uh, it's, it's not as high as what you see uh, going to the north and with the north Walmart and the mall. Uh, and so that's where we started. We laid those in to cover that. And, and again, the idea of having routes that, that could be connected, allowing for transfers at the, the uh, north side Walmart. Okay, Councilman uh, White, you have a follow-up or second question? I, well, I do have a follow-up and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, my second question is that you indicated that there were going to be several opportunities for public comment in January and February. And so my question is, will a press release uh, be sent out and posted on the website so that folks know the specific dates and locations of those uh, public comment opportunities? Go ahead, Mr. Stoddard. Okay, I think I'm going to defer to you, uh, Tom Mason uh, because they handle uh, the coordination on the actual meetings. Okay. Mr. Mason? Yes, um, I was going to re report on that towards the end of the presentation, but I'll do it now. Um, the meeting dates are up on the MPO webpage, planchine.org, um, but I'll repeat those right now. Uh, first off, um, as mentioned, um, because we're uh, the MPO, we you know planning for city and county, and uh, of course the county does provide some funding uh, for the transit program. So we're going to both planning commissions. Uh, the first meeting is the city planning commission on January seventeenth at six o'clock here in the council chambers. The county planning commission will be on Thursday, January twenty sixth at three thirty in the county commission meeting room. And then uh, jumping into February, uh, we then would take uh, after the um, planning commission's recommendations to the governing bodies, the county commission meeting is scheduled for February 21st again in the county meeting room. And then um, the resolutions are presented to the City governing body um, with the first presentation after introduction would be the Public Service Committee on Wednesday, February 22nd. And then the governing body uh, final discussion would be on the February 27th meeting. Okay, that takes care of item number four, but we'll probably come back to it. Uh, Councilman Seagrave? Yes, sir. Um... You indicated a transit would be in the downtown area. It was my understanding when we bought the new facility on Westland Road that that would be the transfer location. Is that what you what you have in mind? Well, we, we actually looked at that and as a transfer point, it is, it's not a very central location. So our recommendation is to still provide a transfer point uh, in the downtown area for, for two reasons. One is there's a lot of activity there to begin with. Uh, and second is it, it's much more centrally located in the community. Uh, although we will be running service out to that uh, new facility um, as a transfer point between routes, we found that it, it does not work as well. It, it does not require a large major facility downtown, but some improvements uh, along the lines of more enhanced bus stops, waiting area, uh, but 
to facilitate operations to have that transfer take place in a more central location. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. I just have to express my disappointment. Uh, that's that's the reason I supported the purchase of that facility. Um, I think the transfer station in front of the parking structure in the past has been very disruptive um, for traffic, for pedestrians, uh, transients. Um, so I was I was pleased when we purchased that on Westland Road with the idea that that would be the transfer station. There would be bathroom facilities. There'd be plenty of parking. Um, so I'm very disappointed in in hearing uh, this development. Thank you. Any other members have any questions on either introduction or the plan? We have Dr. Aldridge with her hand raised as well. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Aldridge. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Esquivel. Through you, um, I too I have to echo my colleague from Ward Two's sentiments. I'm very uh, disappointed, actually, and frustrated that uh, because that's again another reason that I supported the purchase of that building. Um, under the direction of our director, um, Renee, out at transportation, and having had several conversations and having visited with the transport transportation group and the transit people, I guess I'm, um, I'm just frustrated that we're still looking at, I'm, I'm, ex I'm glad we're looking at extending our hours till 10 o'clock, but I really think that for those individuals at the hospitals and the nursing homes, extended care facilities, and the people that are working shift work that work a two to 10 shift, having that uh, transit stop at 10 o'clock is just not feasible. Um, I really think that even if we do micro transit, it really needs to run till 11 o'clock. Um, the other piece is that I, in, I think we have a chicken and an egg situation. We don't really know what our transit needs are because until you offer consistent transit that people can count on, we're not going to see those numbers. Um, I know a lot of people who would be willing to use transit, but can't take an hour out of their day um, each way to use a transit system when we have to go to a central um, transfer station. And um, if you're going across town, it just doesn't make good sense uh, time-wise. So I really am continuing to advocate, and transportation is a, a major concern of mine, but I'm continuing to advocate that at some point we either have to become a route system where people can depend upon that transportation consistently and in all parts of our community, or we need to um, be a micro transit system. This hybrid system, it really is not working out according to people who commonly use the bus system in our, and my constituents who would like to, but just because of how we're currently operating, it isn't feasible. So just a couple of thoughts. Okay, do you wanna make comment on that before we move on to the director? Okay. Just um, maybe briefly on, on the concept of a hybrid system, because what we are, are seeing nationally is a lot of places going to that type of service, because in the, the uh, lower density, like outlying areas here, uh, it just does not support fixed route um, on, a, on an all day basis. But there are areas of the community where that is um, certainly cost effective and justified. And we're, we're seeing this in a lot of communities where they are taking away some routes to operate micro transit as feeders into the fixed route. And, and so I think this is a, a what we're seeing in a number of places we've worked is a, a trend that's taking place across the country that where we operated fixed route a lot of times, we just didn't have the ridership. We can still provide that coverage. You know, an example here is is we can get the coverage out uh, to your distribution centers on the, on the east side, out to Lowe's, where you did not have fixed route service. So we actually can expand the service area. Um, it can be consistent service, but you do have to make the request. But again, the technology allows you to do that with an app on a smartphone and be picked up um, in, a, in a reasonable time and either transfer to fixed route or have your ride completely on micro transit. So we think that the combination makes a lot of sense here as we're seeing in, in a lot of other communities too. Okay, uh, seeing no other questions, we're gonna move on to Director Nemechek and Director Jording on follow-up comments. 
Thank you, Vicki Nemechek. I am the Public Works Director, and I also have with me Renee Jording, the Transit Administrator. Uh, Renee is uh, has been with the Transit um, system for over thirty for almost thirty years. Um, she is the president of the Wyoming Public Transit Association. She is the Wyoming State Delegate for Community Transportation Association of America. Um, so she is well versed in transit and uh, just wanted to let you know that she is, she knows more about transit than I ever will. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about our goals for this plan, plan system. The goals are to improve our public transportation services because uh, we all believe that our that public transportation allows people that couldn't otherwise be independent to be independent. We want to continue to serve our paratransit riders. We want to provide dependable route service in all areas of the city. We want to supplement supplement those route services with microtransit because it broadens our reach. It broadens our reach to the people who are not within our route service, and it broadens our reach to the areas that we can't get with our that we can't efficiently and effectively get with our route services. That micro transit really gives us a broader reach that I believe that our, our current um, riders that ride our micro transit appreciate. Um, we wanna get you to your destination and back faster than what we're currently doing. Um, the route service was uh, an hour around. It took people several hours to get to a destination do their shopping or do their uh, appointments and things, and then to return, it was a several hour process. We're trying to shorten that as best we can. Um, and then we also want to limit transfers. We don't want to have to have people transferring multiple times uh, on their way to, to get somewhere. So microtransit also helps with that. We do have some challenges, as you've heard Mr. Stoddard talk about. In a post-COVID world, we want we want to increase our ridership. We've seen our ridership decrease um, significantly over the years, but that is not just here, but a national trend. So we've, we'd like to get that ridership back up. And in order to do that, we need to provide the best service that we possibly can. And I believe that the mix of route service and microtransit is exactly what we need to, to be able to do that. Um, we need vehicles that that are dependable and we need um, additional vehicles. We currently have problems with um, supply chain issues, parts trying to fix those. We, have, we do have two dedicated mechanics to the transit system. And we can also use other uh, mechanics because they're also located at fleet. So we, we're able to have the, the personnel in our fleet shop. But the fact is we don't always, we're not always able to get those parts. We're not always able to get those buses in a timely fashion. The, uh, we have a two year wait on vehicles um, these days. Uh, so we also have national back orders. Right now we have uh, our newest, our two newest buses are both offline because of warranty issues and we can't keep those two buses running. It creates a, a big problem for us. So, so um, that de those dependable vehicles are, are an issue for us right now. Um, personnel, everybody out there is hiring, and we are no exception. We have we are um, short one full time driver right now, and we are short seven part time transit drivers right now. the The combination of vehicles and personnel shortages and our uh, our big challenges because if we wanted to implement the, that phase right now, we couldn't do it. That phase one. We, we simply can't implement that phase without additional people and additional buses, or at least the buses that we have back in service and on a dependable basis. Um, we've done some things recently. We have a, uh, an agreement with the LCCC to train people if we can hire them to get them on board and then train them to uh, for CDLs with that passenger endorsement that they need. And then um, we've also done some pay increases recently. Uh, small ones for our full timers, but we did increase significantly our by 18% our part timers so that we now have a different pay rate for our full time and part timers, which is new for the transit system. Um, this plan includes a phased approach, which uh, gives us the opportunity to implement as our resources become available. And you did, there was a question about that, but I thought that was important that we 
we could do it in one year increments, but if we are able and have the resources, we could implement faster, which I would, which we would love to do. Um, the last thing is that if we implement this TDP, I think, I, I believe that we will achieve our goals, but there's also um, significant additional money required. So that's something, obviously, you guys carry the purse strings. We will be asking you for more money to uh, help with our personnel issues. We'll need more We'll need more people as we implement more routes. So that is also an increase in the budget. We'll need more vehicles as we in increase our the number of routes and our microtransit. Uh, different types of vehicles, of course, but, but that's obviously a, a big difference. And you saw the table that Mr. Stoddard presented that shows the increase in general fund money that we would require in order to implement this uh, plan. So I, uh, I also would like to just say one thing about the um, transit facility on 18, at 1800 Westland Road. We did purchase that with the thought that it would be our transfer station. Um, this TDP has found that that likely is not the best option, but we do, and when we did purchase it, our thought was also that that will serve as a coordinated transit facility, not only for uh, our buses, our transit buses, but also to give people connections to Uber, Lyft, uh, bus, uh, buses, Greyhound buses, and uh, anything else that we can that we can provide a place for people to pick to pick up that would be a transit a central transit spot. So I, I think that is also an improvement in our plan, even though uh, it doesn't make sense as a as a transfer station. It does make sense as a transfer station for other op options for those travelers to continue there. We'll leave, we'll even put some. Uh, scooters out there <laughs> so people can get around but um if i if anybody has any questions i'd be happy to answer them renee did you have anything okay any questions from anyone on zoom um dr aldrich has her hand raised okay. go ahead dr aldrich thank you chairman Esquivel. um well first and foremost vicky and renee thank you for all your hard work on transit i know it's a challenge and i know that COVID has really made it uh, doubly hard but I'm wondering, um, Vicki, in talking about being able to get our equipment or, or you know, basically our buses um, all running it and optimizing our resources as far as equipment. And I know there's also been some challenges with, you know, finding drivers as well. Um, what do you think? I think part of part of my concern is the phasing um, situation, but I'm wondering what you think it's going to take financially. Uh, what kind of dollar commitment it's going to take in order to optimize our transit system? Go ahead, Director. Vicki Nemetrek, Public Works. Uh, the numbers are included in the slides that show um, what we would need, but we what we did was put together some numbers. Uh, according to the TDP, the local match required, um, phase one, would require $871,396 from the general fund. And that is in addition to what we already get or? Okay, so, so $871,396 from the general fund for phase one, the two routes, paratransit and microtransit. Phase and is that a one-time fee uh, amount or is that an ongoing amount? ongoing and increasing as we move forward to phase two. Phase two would be for four routes, paratransit and microtransit would require $1,653,524 from the general fund. Phase three with four routes, paratransit and microtransit with evening and Sunday microtransit, and that's not extending the routes as you uh, mentioned that you would prefer that we go longer, that just the microtransit in the evenings and on Sunday, that amount is $2,148,387 from the general fund. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Director Nemechek and Director Jordan? Seeing none, um, well, I would have one, and it's for anybody on the panel that wants to and answer it, but 
Are we seeing a different clientele served by companies like Uber and Lyft than what use our transit programs? Renee Jording, Cheyenne Transit. Honestly, I don't know who's using Uber and Lyft, so I, I have a hard time answering that question. I can tell you that our ridership is very similar to what it, it's always been. It hasn't changed much. Okay, probably would, one of the things we'll do going forward is we'll probably reach out to those two companies and, and just get some data from them for what's happening locally. Uh, my other comment would be then, we were to be able to find a facility that was more centrally located, would we be able to reduce the amount of time for a round trip on those routes? So right now you're saying it's 30 minutes one way. Could we reduce that down to anywhere like 20 minutes if we had a centrally located? Actually, those times are, are based on having centrally located point. Uh, you, you, your community has a few challenges, like a railroad line and, and an airport that uh, really make it hard for the, that north-south traffic to you know, keep the time very short. Okay. Um, any other questions? I, we did touch on item number four briefly on the adoption schedule. Who do we have for uh, online question? Chairman, I know Dr. Rennie with his hand raised. Go ahead, Dr. Rennie. Hi, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to go back to when they were talking about costs on the program, um, what opportunities do we have for revenues to offset those increase in costs? Well, I assume if we're having more ridership, we'll take in more revenue. And, and in the past, we've always had grants supplement some of our expenses. So I, you know, they didn't touch on the revenue side. And I was hoping that Vicki or Robin could address that. Can go ahead, Director. Vicki Nemechek, Public Works. The uh, spreadsheet shows the grant opportunities um, that's in the presentation. It shows all of the, what we would need from FTA, what we would need from the um, state, what we need from the county, and then the list of the uh, match from uh, local match. <clears throat> so these matches are already uh, considering those other grant opportunities. Was there another question that I didn't respond no, to? No, so so then I assume it would be, um, in addition, the, the monies you mentioned would be in addition to the grants we're already receiving, so correct. correct. And, and if I may also mention, our revenue from a ridership is not a significant source of revenue. Um, and okay. The recommendation is to actually reduce our dollar fifty ride cost back uh, down to a dollar. So our revenue. Okay. Would... <laughs> um, we also have Dr. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Aldrich. Uh, thanks, Chairman Esquivel. I had thought of another question I wanted to ask Renee and Vicki, and that is, I know that in the world of education, uh, we're being told that um, in the near future, in the next couple of years, uh, th there will only be um, electric buses available um, to school districts. And so I know that we've had a, a purchasing frenzy uh, by districts of diesel buses um, so that they can have those on hand once the only thing that's available is electric buses. And I'm just wondering if you're seeing some of the same uh, requirements and guidelines coming down from federal transit that by a certain year, all of our buses need to be uh, fueled by other means rather than diesel or fossil fuel. Go ahead, Director Jordan. Yes, Renee Jordan with Transit. They they have said they would like us to be all electric within 10 years, and that has been built into our plan, but they haven't given us the data as to when we're not going to be able to get gasoline vehicles at this point. Okay, thank you. That's And thank you for building that into the plan, because I think we need to be forward thinking as we are thinking about transit and where it's going over the next 15 to 20 years in our community. Okay, who else have we got? Uh, Mr. Seagrave. Go ahead, Councilman Seagrave. Thank you through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a 
philosophical question, I guess, have we thought about privatizing this um, and maybe even a combination of private operation and use of um, Uber and Lyft and, you know, possibly some tokens that could handle these outlying areas uh, more efficiently than, than we can do it. Uh, it seems to me if we gave out a $5 token, that would be a lot cheaper than sending a microbus out uh, to the hinterlands to, to deliver somebody. Have we given that consideration? Thank you. Who wants to tackle that one? Director Nemechek. Vicki Nemechek, Public Works. We have we did not consider that in the plan. Um, the transit system, um, it's my understanding that the city took over the transit system from Magic City. Um, how many years ago? 30 years ago. Oh, Renee came with, with that pro program. She was with the transit program before um, when it was at Magic City. It's not something we've considered, but if that were a goal of the council, we could certainly, uh, I think we'd have to go into a different type of plan to look at that. Would you agree, Mr. Stoddard? Yes, A.T. Stoddard with LSC. Yeah, we, we did not look at it specifically in this plan. Uh, the plan was focused on operations and, and putting together a, a, the service plan and capital, but certainly uh, some places have done that. Uh, as noted, a lot of places have taken over uh, private operations because they were too costly or, or not effective. So it, that would be a, a, a very detailed analysis in itself to look at privatizing portions or all of it. Okay, and uh, one more question. I actually have two. I have both um, Councilman White and Councilman Secret with their hands raised. Okay, go ahead, Councilman White. Thank you, Mr. Escobel. A uh, quick question for Mr. Mason. Um, Tom, looking at the Plan Cheyenne uh, website, I couldn't find any uh, listing of the, the dates that you gave us. Uh, the dates in January and February. So if you could like just forward me that link when you get back to your office, I'd appreciate it because I want to, I've had some constituents reach out to me and I can email them the link uh, that, that has that information of uh, uh, further public comment to them. So thank you. Oh, and uh, one other comment uh, to Ms. Nemechek. Uh, my my colleague from Ward Two raises an interesting point on a, a hybrid. I just wonder how that if if we were to take that uh, option, how federal grant uh, assistance would be affected. I wonder if that would uh, would affect our eligibility for some of the assistance that we receive for this program. Go ahead, Director. Vicki Nemechek, Public Works. I just asked. Uh... Ms. Jording about that as as uh, she mentioned that. So it would be a pass through. Those uh, funds would be a pass through to from the FTA or to the state and then the state. Okay. Renee Jording, Cheyenne Transit. The way it would work is the city would still apply for the grants and receive the grants because they are the ones who can receive those federal funds. And then the city would have contracts with the organizations that would be providing the service and then they would disseminate the money to those entities. Okay, so it would work as a pass through. Councilman White, um, do you have a follow up? I do not, thank you. Okay, Councilman Seagrave. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I just, it just seems to me as difficult as it is to get drivers, uh, equipment, buses, etc. If we could eliminate some of the outlying uh, demands the I, I believe you call it the micro um, micro transit uh, through use of private again Lyft and Uber and those kind of things uh, just seems like that would make it a lot easier uh, folks would be able to schedule it uh, directly with with Uber and Lyft and uh, we wouldn't have to be the middleman on all of that so if we could give that some thought you know I don't want to spend days and weeks and months analyzing it but if if we could uh, just give it some thought and see if it makes any sense, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. 
director? Yes, we would be happy to look into that. I will say that our uh, some multiple comments that we've received are that people are not interested in scheduling those rides. That what they want is to walk out to the a bus stop and get on a bus. But I think that we also have uh, received the opposite from some riders is that they they really prefer the microtransit system. So the hybrid seems like a good idea. The uh, the op option of uh, contracting with Lyft and Uber seems like an interesting one. So we will look into that. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Mr. Mason, you you did touch on number four. Is there anything you want to add on the schedule? No, oh, um, Tom Mason, I quickly, I could repeat them. City Planning Commission on January 17th, County Planning Commission on January 26th, and the County Commission, the Board of County Commissioners on February 21st, and then the City Public Service Committee on Wednesday, February 22nd, and then final governing body approval on February 27th. Okay, and then if you could share that with our members and the link for that. And also, uh, Director Nemechek, if you're going to reach out to Uber and Lyft and get us some data. Yes, we can do that. And we are already uh, working with, is it Lyft? With Uber um, to talk about contracting. So that's already on the board. Okay, uh, on the whole overview, do we have any members have any final questions? Okay, hearing none, we are adjourned. Thank you.